the National Physical Laboratory, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research. But first of all, I want you to just have a think. You may not realize this, but you actually live in a world of jiggling atoms. Don't be alarmed by this, it's completely normal. So all the atoms around you, all the atoms you're sitting on, and all the atoms that close you, the atoms you breathe in and out, they're all jiggling all the time. And when we measure the temperature of something, what we're actually doing is we're measuring how fast those atoms jiggle. So there's one way for us to measure temperature, and that's through thermometers and thermocouples. But we can also do something a little more visual. We can do some infrared imaging, so thermal imaging. So the image you can see behind, I hope, is fairly familiar. Some of you may live in one. Um, this is a house, okay, uh, which has been thermally imaged using an infrared camera. And if you haven't seen an infrared image before, let me just give you a little tour. Uh, the darkest colors that you see, they're the colder colors. And the light, so the white and yellow, they're the hotter colors. Now, those colors mean nothing without temperature scales. So I've given you a little hint on the bottom right. So the coldest temperature you see in this image is about 8 degrees, and the hottest is about 16 degrees. So not a huge temperature difference. It looks very dramatic on the, on the thermal image, but it's not that huge of a difference. So the thing about thermal images is that it doesn't just give us temperature measurements. It doesn't just give us a value. It actually shows us where heat is wasted. And that's what I'm talking to you about today. So let me show you another one of these slides. This might also look familiar to you. We all know that laptops run very hot when they sit on our knees, right? We've all had that experience. And it does that for a reason. The electronics that make up your laptop need to operate at a particular temperature. And if you go too far above that temperature, you actually damage the material that makes up the, the laptop, that makes up the battery, that makes up the hard drive, everything. So heat is the enemy of these electronics. So laptop and computer engineers have to try very hard to pump that heat away from the electronics. And that's what you can see in the image. You can see the same thing. Dark is cold, light is hot. And the temperature scale is a little different this time. So you can actually see there's a 50 degree temperature difference from one end of the laptop, so the cold end of the laptop, to the hot air pumping out of the side of the laptop. Now, laptops use a lot of energy. That's how we plug them into the wall. We use our battery to power the laptop. And the heat thing, it's kind of a side effect, and an ugly side effect at that. We're trying to pump it away because it does some damage. But maybe there's something else we can do with that heat. The next one is my favorite one, because I'm a car nerd. I apologize to those of you who aren't car nerds, but I am. This is an engine. It's a pretty heavy-duty engine. It uh, wouldn't be in a standard family car, this one. It's just more like a, a Caterpillar truck, okay? So it's more like a truck engine, really. But again, it's a thermal image. So you can see the temperature of all the surfaces, and you can see how much heat, so how much energy is being produced in a form that actually doesn't add anything to the engine. The primary function of a car engine is to power your car, right? It's pretty obvious. It's to move your car forward. And yet energy is being produced here in a form that is not what we want. It's in a form that's not very useful to us. It's heat energy. But again, is there a way that we can make more of this? Is there a way that we can capture some of this wasted energy, this heat energy, and turn it into something a little more useful? Glad to tell you that not just entirely because of me, but my research area is on thermoelectric materials. Now, that sounds big. I'm going to expect you to remember that word. I'm going to say it a lot. But you can probably guess what we're talking about. Heat, electricity. So these devices are basically solid heat engines. So they pump heat through the device, and they produce electricity, and with no moving parts. So it's quite an attractive concept. You think about the three examples I gave you, where you waste heat in the house, through the walls of a house, through the windows, the laptop, we're trying to actually get rid of the heat, but could we capture it? And in a car engine, you have huge temperature differences. I showed you the Caterpillar engine, but even your car engine has temperatures above 500 degrees at the hot end of the exhaust. That is all energy that's being produced in a form that does not help you. It's being produced in a form that currently we don't really use. So let me show you how these devices work. This is going to keep going on a loop because I always talk over it. Um, <laughs> what you can see in the center, you see the two blocks. There's one with negative charges and one with positive little uh, charges there. That's the thermoelectric material. And basically, in the animation, I've sandwiched it between a hot side and a cold side, so like a heater 
and a cooler. And the way that these thermoelectric generators work is they need a temperature difference, a difference in temperature across the thermoelectric material. The bigger the difference in temperature, the more electricity they produce. And they do that because of this whole jiggling atom thing that I mentioned earlier. When we heat things up, when we, when we see an increased temperature, what we're actually doing is we're increasing how fast those atoms jiggle. Down at absolute zero, which is the coldest temperature that can ever exist, atoms just stop. Everything above that, they're jiggling. If we heat them up more, they jiggle more, and so on. In thermoelectric materials, we don't just give energy to the atoms that make up the material. We actually give a little bit of energy to the electrical charges that exist in thermoelectric materials. So when I connect two of these blocks together, in one block, negative charges flow, and in the other, positive charges flow. So just applying this temperature difference, just getting this heat flow through the device, actually induces a flow of current, which is current electricity. So we have a direct transfer from heat to electricity. So that video, I, the little animation I showed you, had two blocks, right? That's called a thermoelectric couple. We're not that inventive, I'm going to be honest. Um, but to produce a thermoelectric generator, so something that's actually going to be able to turn a good amount of heat into a good amount of electricity, we need to connect lots of these couples together. So this is what they look like in real life. So the top image gives you a little example. And the animation underneath shows you what they look like in the ideal world. They never look like this. They always break. Um, actually, in fact, I broke one on purpose so that we could, I could show our graphics people how to draw one. <laughs> so anyway, so you can see the purple and the blue blocks. They're the positive and negative blocks that we saw in the earlier video. So you connect lots of these up together. And anywhere you have a temperature difference, so anywhere you have a hot surface in contact or close to a cold surface, you can capture that heat flow and you can transform it into electricity. Now, the blocks that you see on top, so you've got like a, a white layer, kind of a blue-white layer, that's a ceramic material. That's a material that's very, very good at high temperatures. So these devices are really sturdy. They can undergo a lot of shaking. They can undergo a lot of pressure. So it's not just about small amounts of heat. These guys are really sturdy. They know what they're doing. So I need to show you a little demo, because I've given you an animation, and I've shown you a picture, and that's all very exciting. But I'm going to show you one in real life. And my lovely assistant is getting me a kettle, which is very important. Thank you. Um, so what this is actually a thermoelectric generator. So it's pretty boring looking, right? It's a block of white stuff. Uh, but inside this device, we have lots of those blocks of positive and negative charges connected to each other. And when I apply a temperature difference across this, we will hopefully produce electricity. It's not that easy to see electricity immediately. So what I've done is I've connected to a little motor with a fan on it. So I'm hoping that if I apply a temperature difference, we might see the fan move. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clip it all up together. So I've just got some stainless steel. This is no magic. Okay? I won't do a magician thing and say, you can come and check this if you like. You can in the break, but it's really it's not that exciting, I'm going to be honest. So I'm just going to clip two bits of metal together. And I've got a little magnet on my motor. So I will just, uh, let me just move this from off. I'll just clip this on, and I'm hoping what we will see is I'm going to put some hot water on one of these cups that I have here, and I'm going to have some cold water in the other. And I'm applying a temperature gradient, so I should produce electricity. That's the theory, so let's see if it behaves itself. Can I have some hot water, please? That's okay. Is it warm? Is it, if it's warm, it'll be fine. So I see it's the kettle that lets us down, not all the electronics and... Not the uh, laptop. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Anyway, I can keep talking, it's fine. <laughs> so, I've got thermoelectric generators really, really sturdy. So I want you to have a think about maybe where we might use these. Okay, so I've kind of given you three clues at the beginning. So house, laptop, what was the other one? So that's part, just, just keep thinking about those ideas. But actually, these have been used for quite some time. They've been used in the space industry. As with all things that sound vaguely futuristic, right? It all starts with an application in the space industry. But what you can see behind me, uh, the image on the left is from the Apollo missions. So a little while ago, probably slightly before some of the students' time, certainly, and mine, actually, I should say that. Um, and that's the Apollo 14 mission. 
Can you see there's a grey kind of column standing in the centre of the image? That is what's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Okay, so I know I'm flinging lots of words at you, but you're very clever, so I believe in you. Um, so we, need, we know we need a temperature gradient, right? Space is cold, so that's a good place to start. So we've got our cold side. We get our hot side. It's kind of actually like a nuclear battery. The nuclear is the little hint there. In the center of this column, what, you can what is actually hidden in there is a small amount of radioisotope source, so plutonium in this case. Very, very small amount. And as that material decays, it produces a lot of heat. So I then take that lovely heat source, I surround it with these thermoelectric generators, and then the grey fins that you see, they're just allowing lots and lots of the uh, cold from the surface of the moon to cool down the other side of the generator. So this produces enough electricity to run all of the cameras that were used during the Apollo missions. This is quite a useful amount of energy. I'm not talking about a couple of watts. I'm not talking about tiny amounts of energy. It's quite useful amounts of energy. And this technology, okay, it's old, but it's gotten so much better, improved materials, improved efficiencies, that it's still being used today. Do any of you recognize what the image is on the bottom right? Any space nerds might, oh, thank you. Space nerds amongst you might recognize it. That is the Mars Curiosity rover. The single coolest thing, I think, that's ever landed on Mars. I just love it. It's a, it's a science lab. It has most of the, the uh, microscopes that I use have been produced in a small form and sent to Mars. I mean, it's incredible. And you can see at the center of that, there's a white column, which it looks kind of familiar, right, at this point. It's the same technology. It's a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So it captures a difference in temperature, a heat flow, and it turns it into enough electricity, in this case, to power all of the scientific instruments on board that rover. And this might worry you to know that that's 120 watts. So think about how much energy we use in our ho homes, and uh, maybe we should be getting NASA to uh, get some more energy efficient materials. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave this here. It'll do its thing, it'll be fine. So hot water, cold water, and I'm hopeful that once the temperature gradient establish, okay, establishes itself, the fan will go. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's think about this, though, right? I've used a lot of electricity to boil that kettle. Okay? <laughs> so you're thinking, ah, oh, yes, she's conning me here. At the moment, these devices are not very efficient. And I am not, and I repeat, I am not suggesting that any of you use your children's body heat to power anything in your homes, OK? I, do, I want you all to go away with that message very clearly. Um, but this is about making systems that already produce heat, making them more efficient. So like the laptop. Can we strap them onto the bottom of a laptop? It's pumping out heat anyway. Can we get a little bit of extra battery life from it? It's about those considerations. It's not huge amounts of energy we're talking about, not massive. So let's see if this video works. Probably won't now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so another uh, application of this, which is a little bit more down to earth, is uh, thermoelectric generators for remote locations. So on the left-hand side, there's a uh, news clipping from the 1950s when a group of Russian scientists connected one of these thermoelectric generators to a standard kerosene lamp like you would use at camping. And you know, you've got a lot of heat in that flame, that kerosene flame in the center. And they cooled down the outside, and they used it as a bit of a publicity stunt to power a radio. So you think, well, that's great, but you know, what, what are we going to do with that? Well, we actually have one of these lamps that we've made ourselves as well. And uh, we, what you can do with it is instead of just powering a radio, what about if we think remote communities? There are some communities who have one mobile phone, if they're lucky, to communicate with the whole outside world. And they can use solar panels. But what happens when the sun goes down? What happens when the weather's not so good? You don't get quite so much charge into your mobile phone charger. If this community is lucky enough to have some of these lamps, they depend on them anyway. They're used as a light source. They're used as a heat source. They're already being used almost as much as they can be. But this extra bit of heat, this heat that's being pumped out of the side of the kerosene lamp, we can capture that and use it to charge the mobile phone. So again, it's not about producing massive amounts of power. This is about making a system that's pretty inefficient, making it just that little bit more efficient. And this is where my research comes in here. So I mentioned to you that the car engines are hot, right? Uh, any of you who drove here tonight, I'm really sorry to tell you, but about 70% of what you put in in terms of petrol or diesel is totally wasted. So 
so thank you for coming. It's very nice of you. Um, but you've actually thrown away almost, well, just over two-thirds of the energy that you've put into your car. And most of that loss is also in the form of heat. So these thermoelectric generators can be used here too. You've got a really hot source of exhaust fuel in the centre of the car up to 500 degrees very easily in a family car. And then you've got the air that surrounds the exhaust. It's hot, but it's a lot cooler. And you can actually use that. That temperature difference is enough at the moment to produce about 700 watts of power. It doesn't sound like a huge amount. It's a kind of an odd number to talk about. But that would power all of the electronics in your fancy car, even the fanciest cars, with every GPS and everything you can think of. It's more than enough to power that. And if we can get just a little bit more power, and that's what I'm trying to do, we can actually replace bits of the car. We can replace the alternator of a car, which produces about a kilowatt of power. If I can get a kilowatt from the heat that's being produced by the car, we are in business. And the last one is kind of the most up-to-date kind of application, really. This is wireless sensors. Lots of factories around the world need to know the condition of their pipes, for example. Think about the oil industry, for example. They are quite fussy about the condition of their pipes, as you can imagine. So they use wireless sensors to check how strong they are and how sturdy they are. But doing that is expensive because you need batteries and they need to be maintained. What happens when the battery runs out? They're actually using thin film thermoelectric devices, very, very small versions of the device that's still powering the fan. They're using that to power a wireless sensor. So they're actually getting enough power from just that little temperature difference to power a wireless transmitter to transmit the data to the computer. No batteries needed. So, in summary, heat is wasted everywhere. Thermoelectrics can help, so we need you to raid the lost amp. Thank you. <laughs>